There's no babbling, bumbling band of baboons quote in this book. He learned a very tough lesson, mansplainer. You will be hearing many a word later, so get your tea ready. Hello, book friends. I am back today after reading Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, and I'm ready to talk about it. Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban really was the turning point in the series. So with Prisoner of Azkaban, we turn the corner and Goblet of Fire is where things really get real. I mean this in a figurative sense, obviously, but I also really do mean that things really do get real for Harry, even more than in the Prisoner of Azkaban. In that book, things really felt real for Harry because Sirius was after him, even though that turned out to be somewhat of a false alarm. And Harry was somewhat able to relax after that. But in The Goblet of Fire, Harry is thrust into something that he is completely unprepared for, and he just has to face the challenges as they come. The biggest difference for me was just that Harry, like Harry, Ron, and Hermione in the previous books, they really chose to go into these different challenges. They made the decision that they wanted to try to do things and help. But in this situation, Harry is thrust into something and he had no choice. So it's just a different type of challenge, I think. And it was a different emotional state for him. So it's interesting to see how he handles that in this book and just how he's gonna handle the resulting trauma in the following books. So I just finished this book and it has been amazing. It's actually blowing my mind just how incredible this series is. It's just so magical and fantastical and it really just blows my mind how ahead of its time this series was. Yeah, I just, I just can't understand it. I don't have very many words to describe just how incredible my experience so far has been, but I do have plenty of words to describe my overall thoughts. You will be hearing many a word later, so get your tea ready. So I'm gonna send you back in time to meet up with past me and let's start reading. Enjoy the reading vlog and I will meet up with you later to talk about all the things that have happened in this book. So we better get going. I realize I forgot to hold up the book earlier, so here it is. I can't tell what's wrong or right Should I go without saying goodbye? All I know is I need to be Somewhere else to set me free I don't know what to do now Need to figure it out, but I don't know how I hope the wind will carry me And take me away to where I should be So I have all of these like random thoughts written down. So these are basically going to be my mid book thoughts, all of the incomplete thoughts that I'm just kind of randomly thinking as I'm reading that may or may not end up going anywhere. I may or may not end up discussing these things again in my final thoughts, but these are all of just, you know, like the little mental notes. First thing being what I noticed right off the bat. What is this talk about milking Najini? She's a snake. Are they milking her venom? Is Voldemort drinking venom? Is that how he's surviving? I don't know. I guess I never picked up on that. That's one of those little details that I never would have noticed as a kid, but now, now that's weird. I'm probably going to say this in like every one of these videos, but again, I'm still just having such a good time getting to know a lot of the characters and their personalities more 
deeply and just more in detail than I did ever before because when I was a kid I wasn't paying much attention to like the characterization of each person I just wanted to like understand the plot so the first one being just Amos Diggory so he's Cedric's dad and in the movies which I am more familiar with recently he's just portrayed as this really like nice nice lovable dad kind of person but in the book he's actually kind of a We've had only two interactions with him so far, and in the first one, he was like like backhanded complimenting Harry on his Quidditch skills and being like, oh, well, Cedric didn't fall off his broom. And the second one, he's just like running his mouth and accusing everybody and accusing Winky and accusing Barty Crouch of conjuring the dark mark when he really had no evidence. He's one of those people that you think of as like a one-upper, one of those people that no matter what you say, they always have to one-up you in some way. They always have to be better in some way. He's one of those people. And I mean, we all know some of those people and they're just super annoying. When Cedric comes back dead um, in the movie and Amos Diggory has, he like wails in sadness and like you feel bad for him like as a father at that point. But now I'm just thinking about that. I'm like, I don't feel bad for him. I feel bad for Cedric, that Cedric is dead, but I don't feel bad for his dad. Also, Ludo Bagman, I had completely forgotten about that guy. I, I looked it up, he was not included in the movie, which I'm not sure why, but yeah, completely forgot about him and he's, he's interesting. I think he hasn't done anything really, uh, at the point where I am right now, he hasn't really been that significant. He's kind of just, he tends to kind of just be there alongside Barty Crouch, but he's he hasn't done anything huge yet. So maybe that's why he's not included in the movie. Maybe he's just kind of a comic relief in the books, but he's not super significant. But he's just another character that I, that I had forgotten about. So yeah, he's interesting too. Muggle neighbors heard bangs and shouting, so they went and called those, what do you call them? Please men. I never would have got that joke when I was a kid. So at page 156, this is the part when Mrs. Weasley gets back from shopping for the kids' school supplies and she gives Ron his dress robes for the upcoming year and she bought she she had to buy his dress robes used when and she bought Harry's dress robes with his money. So Harry got these like nice green dress robes and Ron got the the flowery moldy lace terrible looking dress robes and Ron said and Ron says something that as an adult reading through these books I could kind of tell would come at some point but I had forgotten when or how it actually happens and it's that Ron's jealousy Ron's like envy of Harry is finally coming through because throughout all of these books he's actually been really cool about the fact that Harry has a ton of money and he has a ton of notoriety and he's famous and Ron their family doesn't have much money and Ron lives in the shadow of his brothers and Ron has always been really cool about that he's all it's always seemed like it wasn't a big deal to him but I mean they're getting a little bit older as teenagers now and I figured it was gonna be bound to happen that eventually it would start to get to him and this is the first point where I think he says, why is everything I own rubbish? And you can kind of tell that Molly is a little bit taken aback and she feels kind of bad, but I mean, she's doing her best. And so th this is gonna be, I think, a starting point of what we know continues. Like, I'm not sure how this resolves within this book yet, but I know that this comes up again somewhat in the seventh book. I remember it then when Ron Ron goes away for a while and because of some other like some rift with Harry having to do with Harry's fame and stuff so I guess I don't really remember that clearly so this is the start of something that I think is gonna progress really interestingly I don't know how it's gonna work out yet but I can see this being a really interesting I can see this being a really interesting subplot that can be really meaningful. I'm not sure if I missed it, but I'm really, I don't know, what was it about Harry specifically that Voldemort wanted to kill him for? Was it, was there a reason? 
that he wanted to kill Harry specifically, or was it just because he was he was there? He was a baby. I don't know. I, I did I miss it? I'm at page. I'm at page 217 now in the fourth book. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I, I guess I'm feeling like I missed it. Maybe, maybe I didn't, I don't know. We're getting to the Goblet of Fire part a lot later in this book than I remember. I thought it, I remember it like really dominating the book the first time I read it through. So I don't know. Um, I guess you just perceived things differently when you're a kid. It is Uranus, my dear, said Professor Trelawney, peering down at the chart. Can I have a look at Uranus too, Lavender, said Ron. That joke, I'm sure it went completely over my head when I was a kid, and I'm pretty sure I remember my mom having to explain that one to me. Awkward. So one of Hermione's subplots in this book is the spew. Uh, I forget what it's I forget what it stands for, but it's about the house elf liberation. She doesn't like the fact that house elves are enslaved to their masters. And I feel like this is an interesting one because in terms of like the way that we think of slavery, like we think of slavery as ultimately bad, like it's just bad across the board. And even today, slavery has been abolished for a really long time at this point, but we still see the effects of slavery that are still lingering in our society. and against people whose ancestors were enslaved and that hasn't gone away so just because they're just because slavery has been abolished doesn't mean all is well so i can kind of understand why hermione is so passionate about this and like she just wants the best for them however everybody around hermione who's been in the wizarding world for a lot longer than she has plus the house elves themselves including dobby have said that it's basically their culture and they do like it so and it's like this they just this is how they live and they are a different species they're not humans so i guess i'm on the fence like from our human perspective slavery is unacceptable and we don't condone that but from the house elves perspective it is acceptable and it's just how they live so like what is the moral so like which is the moral high ground here is it hermione wanting to make them be not enslaved and making them be free and is that the right thing to do or is it more that she's pushing her human culture on a species that is not human and therefore that is wrong because she's trying to like impose her own moral values on a different species or a different culture and she's just impeding on their culture so I don't know. I, I have to think this through a little bit more and see how this how it works out. But yeah, I'm a little on the fence about this one. SPEW stands for the Society for the Promotion of Elfish Welfare. I feel like the jokes are back in this book. I, I guess it's just a just as a nice reprieve, I guess, from the darkness of the Prisoner of Azkaban. Now we're going to have something a little more lighthearted and humorous, I guess, before more darkness in the next book which i think i remember so uh, yeah i'm enjoying all the humor and the jokes i like jokes i feel like it's time for cho to be described as something i feel like it's time to give cho some sort of description other than pretty like the only thing we know about her since we started hearing about her several books ago is that cho is so pretty like is there anything else about Cho? I mean, I guess we know that she's in Ravenclaw, but anything else? Can you give us something about Cho that is not Cho is very pretty? There's no babbling, bumbling band of baboons quote in this book. I guess they made that up for the movie, but that was like the defining line from the movie. I thought that was just the most hilarious part. I can't believe Jake. Did J.K. Rowling really not write that? Dang, did anybody else find it weird and hypocritical that Percy gets so irritated when Barty Crouch calls him Weatherby, yet he can't yet he couldn't be bothered to get Winky's name correct? What a hypocrite. For the second or third time, somebody, this time being Rita Skeeter, has called Hermione a silly little girl and told her to basically shut up because she doesn't know what she's talking about. When all of these times she did know what she was talking about and she was right. I don't know, is this, is this just making a point that this is life as a woman? Hermione 
is right. And all of these people who are telling, who are calling her a silly little girl and telling her to sit down probably know she's right, but they just want to silence her. And it's irritating. I think they do get back at Rita Skeeter somehow in this book, but she's, she's annoying. I'm going to have a lot to say about her later in my thoughts because I think she represents something in our culture that is just disgusting. And I have a lot to say about that, so stay tuned. This may or may not be related to the hate mail Hermione is now receiving thanks to Rita Skeeter's article. I swear so many things about Harry Potter were just like ahead of their time. Like hate mail, was that even really a thing back then? But it's, it's a thing now. How did she predict it? <laughs> Percy again, please don't bother me unless it's something important. Like Amos Diggory, it's like Percy's character was kind of dumbed down for the movie to make him more palatable so that we wouldn't hate him because he was one of the Weasleys. But he's a really hateable guy. And I don't know, maybe he's not gonna have anything bad happen to him because he's a Weasley and it would be just tragic for the Weasley family and we, we don't want tragedy for the Weasley family. They're a nice family besides Percy. But uh, I've just had it with that guy to like, uh, like he doesn't have very many interactions with women, but can't you just imagine him being the ultimate mansplainer? Maybe that's why he doesn't have very many interactions with women. There are so many real world issues that come up with this book, it's not even funny. I mean, it's really, I mean, honestly, it's really not funny, a lot of it. It was just mind blowing to me, just how many relevant things are going on in this book that are still so relevant to today, even though this book was published, I wanna say 2002 or four, sometime around before the internet was as filled with hate as it is today. In this book, we're talking slavery, bigotry, gambling addiction, political corruption, political retaliation, tabloid culture, and questionable journalistic practices, the wealth and poverty gap. And those are just the things that I can think of off the top of my head. Not to mention just the normal everyday bullying and murder. So we don't need to discuss every one of these in detail because I think we've all seen enough videos on political corruption. But I do want to talk about what's going on with Ron and Hermione. This is the first time that I've noticed Ron and Hermione having their own things going on besides just what's going on with Harry. In the previous books, Ron and Hermione pretty much only showed up and all of their actions revolved around Harry's predicament. Everything that they did was done in order to help Harry's story move forward. But they didn't really have any arc or storyline of their own. The closest thing really was Hermione and her time turner, but even that was just used to help the conclusion with Harry and it wasn't really a separate thing that she had going on. Um, there was also like Ron and Scabbers and uh, Crookshanks. That was just kind of there so that they could reveal that it was Wormtail later. So it wasn't specifically about Ron and Hermione. But in this book, Ron and Hermione are starting to really be individuals. And that's awesome because it makes this feel like it's more of a real world where they are their own people and it's not just a world that revolves around Harry. So let's talk about Ron in this book. So it's always been a standing fact that Ron and the Weasleys don't have much money. Harry has a lot of money. He also has a lot of fame and notoriety and he gets a lot of attention while Ron lives in his brother's shadows. And up until this book, Ron has always just been very cool about it. He's never showed that it bothered him or let it affect his friendship with Harry. But I feel like at this point, this is where being the poor sidekick is really starting to get to Ron. And just from like a human standpoint, it was bound to happen eventually. I forgot that it even came up in this book because as a kid, I can just see that this kind of thing would go completely over my head because it's a pretty nuanced thing that's happening amongst all of the other grand things that are happening in this book, but it's definitely noticeable and it comes up several times. So as an adult, I definitely noticed it, especially in today's climate and like the wealth and poverty gap. It's really noticeable that this is something that's really nagging at Ron and, and Harry is not really noticing it. It's not like Harry is not really sensitive to it because I mean, I guess Ron isn't really doing a really good job of saying his feelings and Harry is not a mind reader, but still, Harry is just really oblivious to all of this. So just amongst his brothers, Ron is the least interesting in the family. 
Mr. and Mrs. Weasley are always talking about all of the amazing things Bill and Charlie have done. Percy is a prefect and he's done amazing things, I guess, and he's just being annoying. Um, Fred and George are constantly in trouble, and so all of the attention is just really on all of them. And Ron, he doesn't really get into trouble, he doesn't do anything amazing either. He's just kind of there, and it's starting to get to him. And then he gets into a friendship with Harry, and Harry's problems trump Ron's from just all angles. I know this is a book technically about Harry, but Ron really has had no storylines where he had any of his own problems arise that Harry was able to you know, help Ron with something that he was going through. And even though the story is about Harry, I feel like including something like that could, you know, actually improve on Harry's character. So far, something like that hadn't come up, but I think this is the start of that coming up. I didn't remember that this had come up in this book, but I do remember that it came up in a pretty overt way in Deathly Hallows. Ron actually leaves for a little while because he's just so tired of being like second best and having all of the attention just always on Harry. And so I feel like this is something that they're bringing it up now, but I don't think this is going to go away and it probably will be a kind of a running theme for Ron for the rest of the series until it's finally resolved for good in Deathly Hallows. Also, reading between the lines here, Rita Skeeter also wrote an article about Harry and Hermione being in a secret relationship, which we know is not true. They are 14 years old now. They're starting to grow up and want to form relationships. I, so I can see why that article really would have bothered Ron, but he didn't want to say anything about it and he didn't know how to express how he was feeling, especially, and then Hermione went to the ball with Victor Crumb and so he was just feeling all kinds of things that he didn't feel like he had anybody to talk to because everybody was like a player in this big conspiracy besides him and he just had no one. So I mean to conclude this storyline within this book, Harry and Ron do make up but I don't feel like it was a very good makeup. Like they just kind of like look at each other and they have like a silent truce but that's not working out the problem. Like I mean I guess what can you really expect from two 14 year old boys? They don't know how to express emotions very well but what they did was not solve the problem. So, I mean, like they, they basically buried it for right now. So by the kind of the middle of the book, they were at a truce, but still there are little comments that I noticed after that point, little snide comments from Ron that continued past that point. And so we can just see that Ron is not over it. So, I mean, it's gonna be interesting how this develops in the next two books and how it blows up in Deathly Hallows and how they end up truly resolving it at that point because I really don't remember. So meanwhile, Hermione also has her own storyline going and it is SPEW, the Society for Promotion of Elfish Welfare. So at the beginning of this book, and I think actually in Prisoner of Azkaban too, Hermione really doesn't like the whole house elf culture thing. She really, she just likens it to slavery. She doesn't like the fact that house elves are you know basically slaves they do whatever their masters tell them they're owned by their masters and they have no rights of their own so she just likens it to human slavery and that all house elves basically just need to be freed because it's what's morally right and hermione being hermione she goes all out she sets up this society for promotion of elfish welfare she creates badges and she's really going around throughout the entire book trying to get people to join her but as she goes around trying to get people to join she is getting a lot of pushback and she's realizing that it's not as much of an easy black and white issue as she's making it out to be so from a human perspective we all know that slavery was very bad and even today after slavery has been abolished for year, decades, centuries almost, we still see the lasting lingering effects of slavery in today's society. And so it's understandable that Hermione doesn't want the house elves to suffer that kind of pain and suffering just because they're so cute and they're so happy and they just seem so innocent. However, I feel like Hermione is looking at it through a very anthropomorphic standpoint. We understand that slavery is bad for humans, but house elves aren't human. And this is like the main pushback that Hermione is getting. Everybody around her says that 
this is their culture. This is what they like to do. It's just in their nature. And Hermione is just having a really hard time understanding that and accepting that. So while it's a noble cause and it makes sense from like a human standpoint of slavery being bad, this is an example I think of Hermione pushing her human values on another species. It would be like going up to a lion and saying, you are going after those poor gazelles and you're hurting them, that's wrong, but that's just what they do. And we can't impose our human values on a species that just does different things and has different methods for surviving. So I guess the lesson here is that even though the house elves situation looks very wrong to humans, if they say that they're happy and it's their culture, then we need to believe them. So I suppose this is a lesson on acceptance. And when you vehemently disagree on your own personal grounds, other species and other people see things differently. And so we need to respect that. So getting back to Harry and what Harry has dealt with besides the obvious, I think one of Harry's biggest lessons in the end of his arc for this story was about meaning well, but hurting people in the process and just how demoralizing that feels. Throughout all of the other books and this book, Harry just has good intentions. He doesn't want to hurt anyone and he really just really does want to help. So when he and Cedric sort of helped each other out with figuring out the clues and working through the tournament, Harry thought Cedric deserved the win as much as he did. So he thought he was doing something good by sharing the win and saying that they're gonna touch the cup at the same time. I also feel like Harry really just wants to feel united. He wants to feel like a part of something because he's singled out so much. Like he's always kind of pointed at as that is the boy who lived, but people don't, a lot of people, they don't know him and they don't see him as a person. They kind of just see him as this symbol of Voldemort going down. And so he really wants to feel like one of the masses. He wants to feel like one of the people. And this goes back to what Ron thinks about him. Ron thinks Harry really enjoys all of the attention and he just revels in it. And I don't think Harry really does. I think Harry really just wants to feel like one of the crowd. Not to mention, I think Harry also has a little bit of imposter syndrome because he knows he wasn't supposed to be in this tournament. He doesn't meet the age requirement. And yet here he is and he beat out Victor Krom and Fleur when they were the chosen champions for their schools and they were of age. And here's Harry who wasn't supposed to be here and he's there. And so he feels even more somewhat obligated to give Cedric his moment. Long story short, we know what happened. Harry has good intentions. He wants to share the win with Cedric and Cedric ends up dead for it. This wasn't Harry's fault. He had no idea this was gonna happen, but I think this is a trauma that's gonna stick with Harry. And it's interesting to see how this is gonna play out in the next books, because this was a really, in addition to just the trauma of dealing with Cedric dying, it was the lesson itself is traumatic that he had good intentions, but he killed someone. Well, he didn't kill someone, but because of his actions, someone ended up dying. And so, I mean, it's, it's a sad situation. So I'm interested to see how Harry deals with it. Now it is time for the traditional Snape update. So there's not really any clear new information about Snape in this book. We didn't really get any new backstory on him unless I'm forgetting something. But if it was really interesting, I don't think I would forget something about Snape because I am looking out for what he's up to in all of these books. He was just kind of there being a bully as always. He didn't do anything that was seriously for or against Harry. He was just kind of there in potions class being annoying as usual. However, we do have a new mystery about him. So we didn't get any new information to answer questions about him, but we do have a new something to think about. So basically after Harry gets out of Dumbledore's memories in the Pensieve, Harry asks Dumbledore, what is it about Snape that makes Dumbledore so sure that he's never going back to the dark side? And Dumbledore responds with something like, that is a matter between Professor Snape and myself. I mean, so basically it's private and it's not for Harry to know, at least not right now. I don't remember specifically the reason why. I'm sure it will be revealed later. I'm sure it has something to do with that, like always the thing, the thing that we know kind of defines Snape's character and his arc. That is gonna be what defines Snape's character. So I'm very excited to find out what that is and how it all 
plays a part in what's what Snape's been doing so far. Always an enigma, that Snape. In this, so we've also got lots of other things happening in this book. We've got Rita Skeeter representing slimy journalists everywhere, teaching children how not to be a journalist. We've got Fudge, the typical politician, all jovial and happy when things are going his way, but as soon as things start not going his way, all he worries about is his own job. I may not get reelected. That's basically it. All they want is to get reelected. We also know that politics play a huge role in the Order of the Phoenix, so get ready for that. If I have to pick something to nitpick or complain about, I would say it is the use of the truth serum, which I don't like in any book, and I mean, I don't love it in this book either. I guess out of all places, the Wizarding World is the most logical place to use a truth potion because it is Snape's specialty and potions are just a part of the wizarding education. But I just feel like it's a little bit like cheating in the narrative sense. It's just kind of taking the easy way of explaining things that happened rather than having it worked into the narrative in a more organic way. Just a few drops of the truth concoction and the culprit or whoever just spills out the entire story without the main character, without the characters having to like go and investigate and figure out what happened. Instead, someone just lays it all out there for them. So it just lays out there all the information that we've been waiting for. And it saves the characters from having to go and do all the work to figure out the answers that we've been waiting for. So in a sense, it, it makes things shorter. So, I mean, maybe it was necessary in this case, this book was already very long. So if they had to go and investigate to figure out all of the information that they learned from Barty Crouch. Did I just say Barty Crouch? Barty Crouch. Junior on their own, this book would have been like probably twice as long. I suppose it was necessary and we needed to just get the, <laughs> we needed to keep it moving and just get all the information out there. So yeah, I mean, it's not a big deal. And I think it was necessary and it worked in this case. But that is just something that I'm not a huge fan of in narratives. So the end of Goblet of Fire really foreshadows the events of Order of the Phoenix. And it foreshadows the tone really well. I felt like the tone of most of the Goblet of Fire was pretty lighthearted. It was pretty fun. Like they were going through the tournament. Everyone was just excited and they were meeting new people. It was just fun and light. But the moment Harry like brought Cedric's body back, I literally felt like there was like a dark cloud closing in over their world. And it and it's like, I don't even really know what to say. It felt like the Dementors were moving in, even though they weren't, but the way that they describe how the Dementors make things feel, like that is how I felt when Harry brought the body back. And just the conclusion of this story, it just felt so dark and heavy. So I have this like feeling of dread going into Order of the Phoenix. So let me tell you a secret that I didn't know I was keeping. I never actually finished Order of the Phoenix the first time. I thought I did. But thinking back, I was so aggravated with Umbridge. I don't, I think I put the book down and just never picked it up again. So I'm thinking probably about the last one third of the book is gonna be completely new to me. Never read it before, know the general events just from the movie, but if there's anything the movie didn't include, it'll just be completely new to me. So, I mean, if you've never read this book, then we're in the same boat and we're, we're gonna experience this together for the first time. This book was already just so much to take in and I'm just imagining the Order of the Phoenix with even more dark and heavy and real world issues is gonna be even more to take in. It's just incredible how many things this book has managed to touch on. So many real world issues and things that were just ahead of its time. I think this is my new favorite book in the Harry Potter series. My childhood taste wasn't good but that's not a revelation to anybody. So those are my thoughts on Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. I think I've mentioned it before, but this series just keeps getting better and better. There's just so much going on and it feels so multi-dimensional. It doesn't feel like just a one kind of path story. There are so many different things happening, so many different little sidelines, so many characters that are just getting more and more developed as we go and it's just incredible. I almost, I don't have words. With most fantasy books, I struggle to find the reason why I should care. But with Harry Potter, I don't have to think 
hard at all to find the reasons why I should care. They're all, there are just so many reasons. There are so many characters that I love and so many storylines that are so interesting. And there are just a million reasons why I care. And why can't more books be this amazing and make me care? At first I was thinking maybe it was because a lot of books they center around really young characters, like 16, and I thought maybe I just don't relate to a 16 year old. But this series started when these kids were 11 and they're 14 now, and they have more emotional depth. Maybe Hermione thinks Ron has the emotional depth of a teaspoon, but I think they have quite a lot of emotional depth. But yeah, I just care so much about all of them. I feel so bad for Ron with what he's going through. Hermione is also trying to find her way in the wizarding world. She, she is very smart and very book smart and she's read a lot of facts, but she was raised with muggles as was Harry. And so she just doesn't have like the understanding of the wizarding world that say the Weasleys do. So Hermione's journey of like learning cultural nuances is interesting and you really feel her. And Lupin, I just love Lupin. We didn't see him in the Goblet of Fire, but I know we're gonna see him in the next book. I think he's there. In the meantime, even though we haven't seen him, I hope he's doing well. So yeah, I think that is all I have been talking for long enough. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, subscribe if you haven't already, and ring that notification bell so you don't miss any of my other ramblings on the rest of the Harry Potter series and whatever other books that I decide to read. Until next time, I will see you later. Bye!